Good afternoon. I'm Paul McLaughlin. I'm AI Research Leader, and I'm part of Ericsson Research based in Santa Clara, California. Today, I'm going to be talking about how Ericsson is using AI to help address sustainability and climate change. Because we know that climate change is real and having devastating impacts now. Humans have caused one degree centigrade of global warming above pre-industrial levels. And NASA and NOAA say that 2020 was the second hottest year on record globally. Climate change is causing extreme weather events, which are the most visible effect of climate change. But the frequency of extreme weather, like wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms, is increasing in the United States. And in 2019, extreme weather cost $45 billion in the United States alone. This also has pretty important societal impacts because climate change damages hit low-income Americans in the South hardest, and minorities and people of color bear a disproportionate share of the climate change burden. The time to act is running out. So what do we need to do? The carbon law teaches us that emissions must be cut by half every decade to reach net zero by 2050. So by 2030, the information and communication technology sector can have a massive impact towards that goal. In 2020, 54 gigatons, which is a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions came from the ICT sector. So following the carbon law to avoid catastrophe, emissions needed to have peaked last year. And between 2030, the 2020 and 2030, we need to have a further 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and for every decade following that until 2050. At the same time, we also have to invest in carbon sinks like forests to help capture some of the carbon we've already emitted. Action is required right now. Otherwise, the longer we delay, the bigger and faster reduction is required. Digitalization, though, is an exponential technology which will help us address this target even more quickly. Ericsson research indicates that the ICT sector can enable reductions in global and greenhouse gas emissions by 15% globally. And this is based on existing ICT technology. More opportunities to go exceed that 15% will likely be enabled by technologies like 5G and machine learning and AI that Ericsson is investing in heavily. We see a particularly big impact on the energy, industry, and transportation sectors, which I'll be walking you through some examples, as well as speaking to my own research on AR and VR and how that will help address uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the main point is that decarbonization solutions ex exist today. We don't need to wait for a silver bullet. And the estimated financial benefit of low carbon is 26 trillion dollars by 2030 for reference. So we have an incredible opportunity ahead of ourselves. So Ericsson is leading the way and we are reducing emissions and impact of our company's activities, our products and services, and this also will have a dramatic impact on society. And so our goal is to be carbon dioxide neutral by 2030, which speaks to our company's impact. And this includes fleet vehicles and facilities, that our goal is for 5G to be 10 times more efficient than 4G, which speaks to the impact of our products. Because 30% of network OPEX today comes from energy consumption, and 90% of mobile network operator emissions are from network power. So for example, we are building a smart factory in Louisville, Texas. Uh, we are pursuing lead gold and lead zero carbon certifications, and 90% of the materials for that factory will be diverted from landfill. landfill. We've installed 1,600 solar modules, and we produce over a million kilowatt hours annually, which is enough to power 93 U.S. homes for a year. We have water recapture uh, tanks, so we can capture and reuse rainwater. Uh, which is enough for us to, uh, enough water for one U.S. home for 133 days. So this is an example of how Ericsson is actually investing to ensure that our products uh, are sustainable 
and helping to show how manufacturing can transition towards a low carbon future. We also want to reduce the impact of digital networks. So the ICT sector's carbon footprint is estimated to be 1.4% of the global total. One thing I really want to point out, because I think it's remarkable and it shows how we are using technologies like AI today, is that emissions have remained constant while data traffic has quadrupled and the number of subscribers has increased by 30%. And one of the main reasons for that is because we've seen big energy efficiency gains from technology shift, uh, from the technology shift from desktop and laptop to handheld. But the ICT sector has decarbonization solutions that can get us to, can, they can help lead to a 50% energy reduction or emission reduction by 2030. So things like renewable electricity to power networks, the ICT sector today is the largest purchaser of renewable power, mobile network efficiency, where we can see Ericsson's leadership uh, role in innovation, uh, but we worry that energy consumption will increase dramatically if 5G is deployed like 3G and 4G were. So Ericsson's technology leadership is breaking this energy curve. Uh, hardware modernization can drive up to 30% reduction in power with higher data throughput, and software can drive up to 50% reduction in power with no impact to consumers. This allows operators to decouple mobile data traffic growth from energy consumption and carbon emissions. We're also transforming transportation. So transportation emissions constitute 60% of the global total or 8.6 gigatons of CO2 per year. Commercial transport powered by renewable electricity is critical for decarbonization and a robust 5G innovation platform will be required for this future, for further development of this technology. A fully built out 5G network will be required to operate autonomous vehicles at a massive scale. So the challenge is, how do, how do we provide affordable and safe transportation and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And an example of solution of this is Ericsson, a Swedish startup called Einride, and Swedish mobile operator Telia created an electric and autonomous transportation system that is safer and more sustainable. And the impact is that Einride says electric vehicles powered by renewable uh, renewables reduce carbon emissions of, of a logistics network by up to 90%. Autonomous driverless commercial vehicles also have less downtime, more, more reliability, and lower total cost of ownership, and will also lead to better air quality. So how does 5G fit in? 5G enables higher speeds, lower latency, and increased reliability for the, for the network and capacity. We also think the digital divide is a critical component to sustainability as well, because the digital divide is most pronounced in rural and minority communities. Today in the United States, 37% of rural students lack adequate connectivity and this has really critical impacts as schools are closed during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you lack connectivity, you cannot attend e-learning. And according to Deloitte, the digital divide currently costs the United States economy $130 million a day. So as an example of how Ericsson is, is tackling this problem, uh, the Rutland City Public School System partnered with Vermont Telephone and Ericsson, and we installed next generation 4G and 5G wireless radios and antennas in fewer than 10 days. So Vermont Telephone delivered modems and routers, which connected students to e-learning. Rutland City Public Schools delivered Google Chromebooks that have wireless connectivity, and this happened in not in weeks or months, but in less than 10 days. And homes in Rutland now have wireless speeds well above 10 meg 100 megabits per second, which enables students now to access world-class education and e-learning opportunities. And Ericsson is committed to this globally. So we are partnering with UNICEF to make this possible globally for students around the world to really bridge that digital divide. We also think that 5G will help enable a transition to renewables. So the United Nations says that by 2050, 80% of all the world's power needs to come from renewables. And this will help us 
get to that decarbonization that is critical for climate action. So the challenge for renewables to scale up is a, there's a large number of power generators, multiple solar panels and wind farms, and bi-directional energy distribution, power sold and purchased from a grid as needed. And we have fluctuations in power generation because renewables can sometimes be unpredictable. There may not be wind one day. So the solution to this problem is smart grids. More renewables means the distribution system operators need total control of power distribution networks. And distribution system operators need to respond rapidly to balance power production and load to avoid outages. So the role of 5G is that distribution system operators see digitalization and connectivity as key enablers in transition to renewable power. Distribution system operators recognize cellular tech connectivity offers lower capex compared to cabling for grid communications, and real-time power system management requires low latency communi uh, communication connection. Uh, and we can reduce interruptions by up to 75% with ICT compared to today's level, according to a Swedish uh, distribution system operator. Digitalization is also critical for the industrial sector. So the industrial sector currently accounts for 32% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the challenge to decarbonizing this is that the industrial sector needs to meet consumer demand while cutting emissions by 50% by 2030. So business as usual is not sustainable and we have to transition from linear to circular business models, which is what we think of as industry 4.0. And the role of connectivity and industrial process optimization is vast. So by 2024, 5G will cover 65% of the global population, and there will be 4.1, or we believe there will be 4.1 billion cellular IoT connections. And so that ubiquitous connectivity enables real-time measurement and real-time AI of industrial processes on a massive scale. The exponential roadmap shows that up to 20% reduction in annual energy intensity po is possible by real-time monitoring of processes, things like AI and energy use, and the AI itself will help us get to continual optimization of processes. So Ericsson is using connectivity in our smart factories today in Tallinn, uh, Estonia, and in the United States to implement use cases to increase efficiency and reduce our own carbon emissions. So we're showing how this can be done today. But the role of connectivity is really critical in enabling the circular economy because it, it increases the lifetime of products and enables reuse. For example, 60 to 75% of energy can be saved by using recycled instead of new steel and material reuse needs to grow. Digitalization can track materials and products from manufacturing and reducing waste by asset tracking, uh, tracking can ha really help during logistics as well. So I wanna pivot and talk about some of my own research because I was speaking to you a lot about it, er, uh, how Ericsson sees tackling this challenge across the industry, across all the industries we partner with and how connectivity plays a role. But the team I work on works on augmented and virtual reality, which are technologies that will help bring uh, full experiences to people. And we are thinking of this as it relates to carbon emissions, sustainability. And I'll give you an example. Air travel today uh, contributes to 2.5% of global CO2 emissions. And just a single round trip flight between New York and London produces 6.67 tons of carbon dioxide per passenger. While a lot of travel is incredibly important, it's something I personally love because I love to have the sense of being in a place, the smell, the taste, the sounds of a uh, taste of food, the sounds of the environment. But a lot of travel today is to take a tour of a factory or look at a demo of a product or shake a uh, person's hand so they can conclude a business meeting. But what if I told you that we are working towards a vision using AI, 5G, and a lot of in critical hardware research to enable people to have that same tactile experience from their own home. I'd like to show you a video about that.
I get goosebumps every time I see that video. So our vision at Ericsson Research is that by 2025, we will be able to have advanced technology that will allow people to have full five sensory immersive experiences across a mobile network. And we think our vision by 2030 is for people to be able to share things such as memories or thoughts using brain computer interfaces. One of the critical challenges that we are trying to solve using AI is spatial computing. So for us to have interactive content and experiences, we have to use AI to understand the physical environment around the user and the objects in those environments. And that means creating things like spatial maps and environmental understanding, but also enriching those spatial maps with semantic information. So not only do we know where an object is located or where buildings are located, we also know what types of objects they are, what the relationship the end user has with those objects. And this will really enable us to create that full five sensory content and experience. Because once we have that information, we can then generate overlays. And so these overlays are critical uses for AR and VR. So here as an example is what you might see through your headset when you go to pick up your rental car uh, in the future. So in order to place this overlay on top of your rental car with your return date, the price per day and the like, we have to understand the object, we have to understand the environment. We have to do this incredibly rapidly because users can experience uh, what we call virtual reality motion sickness if there's any delay greater than about 40 to 50 milliseconds. So this means we have to process data transmitted across the network or on the device itself and get a response within less time than it takes you to blink. So that's one of the key and critical challenges that we are working on in my team and why we're excited for the latency for 5G. Because that content placement is extraordinarily computationally complex. And we worry that people will not have that same, the same quality of experience unless we can have that computation at the edge, but also to have the speed and latency for the algorithms for the network uh, so that all the overlays, the content, the entertainment that you see through your AR and VR headsets uh, are correctly placed and are personalized for you. This is a challenge though, because it also requires AI, it requires a mobile network, it also requires headsets. And XR headsets or AR and VR headsets today are evolving rapidly. So today, there aren't any commercially available headsets that have embedded 5G chips inside of them. So that means that headsets and these experiences are not fully mobile yet, if you'll forgive the pun. AR and VR headsets cannot, without 5G chips, cannot push connectivity and data processing over the network unless they're connected to Wi-Fi. So in that example I just showed you in the car rental pickup garage, the challenge will really be that without 5G or network connectivity, uh, we may not be able to get to calculate that overlay of without, unless you're connected to Wi-Fi. Once we have 5G chips inside of the headsets, people will be able to take this level of computation and interactivity with them wherever they go. And we also think that not only will 5G help address the mobility aspect, it solves a lot of the technical problems or it addresses a lot of the technical problems that are inherent uh, in spatial computing. So for example, one millisecond end-to-end -end latency is the standard for 5G. And that dramatically reduced headset, that dramatically reduced latency means that headsets can work with real-time data. So that means as objects or the environment changes in the, in the end user's field of view, we can track objects, we can correctly track overlays so that content and overlays in XR move with the environment and move with the end user. And 20 gigabits per second down speed, 10 gigabits per second up speed means we may not have to compress content or video as much so not only will you have content that reacts in real time, it will look real as well because we may not have to compress it as significantly. This will also really help with spatial computing because it will improve the accuracy and precision of environmental understanding algorithms like simultaneous localization and mapping. We also are really excited about the possibilities of 
edge computing for spatial computing. So pushing data processing uh, to the edge of the network really will enable rich experiences and immersive experiences that are mobile as well. And with edge computing, one millisecond uh, data travels at the speed of light. So one millisecond means that an edge computing facility can be located upwards of 50 miles from the end user. But we're also working to be able to think of how to make smaller edge facilities. It can be located even closer to the end user, which will really help us address that latency challenge for machine learning and AI. So if we can, for example, think about how to uh, distribute where data is processed, that will really help us reach that latency ceiling that is critical for quality of experience for AR and VR. And that 5G really means that the headsets and the form factors we will see are evolving rapidly. So if we can offload computing into the edge of the network or across the network, it means we can see, and we are starting to see, smaller headsets that have a physical form factor that is lighter and smaller in size. Once 5G radios are inside of these headsets, we'll be able to process and experience AR and VR content outside of the home that updates in real time with that incredible latency from 5G and the speed. Once we push processing into the edge of the network as well, we'll see longer battery life, or we believe we will see longer battery life because we will probably need fewer chips on, on the actual headsets. We don't need to have uh, ASICs that consume quite a lot of, of battery. So we will see people be able to wear their headsets all day long like they use their cell phone today. And the key piece I think is the most exciting for me is around collaboration. Because without connectivity, without 5G, and frankly without AI as well, people can't have a really difficult time collaborating. So if we wanted to have a business meeting in person or look at a product demo together, uh, it will be a challenge to make sure that we are seeing the same thing at the same time and to interact with it so we can change things and collaborate together, play games together, watch entertainment together. That's what the latency from 5G and the mobile network connectivity will enable is that collaboration. And just to give you a couple of examples, this is the Lenovo A3. So these are uh, headsets that are commercially available today. And we're already starting to see a dramatic change in the physical form factors. And this is an Nreal. So we are seeing headsets for AR and VR that are starting to look a lot like the glasses I'm wearing today. And that's our vision for how a, uh, and our vision is that the Internet of Senses is coming. And our vision, as I said, is for this to be have the technology in place by 2025 to enable full sensory internet and connectivity. And so as you can see in this image, we may tackle sustainability by needing, removing the need to travel and meet in person. So here we see a person having a business meeting with someone at, with a hologram. And because of the placement, because of the connectivity and latency from 5G, that hologram is able to travel with the person. You can share a secret and whisper, and you can shake that hologram's hand and feel the weight of their hand. So I really want to thank you for your time, for listening to me. The message I really want to impart you with is that climate change is real. It is critical that we address it. And every day that we wait, the problem gets a little bit harder to solve. But by solving climate change, like Erickson takes very seriously, it's not, a, it's not a solution or it's not a problem that has no solutions. Using existing technology, we can already get 15% reduction in greenhouse gases. And we at Ericsson think we can go even further than that. And we are really excited to be on this journey with you. Thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to your questions.